thank you, Reverend Hall, and thanks to Intimate Conviction for welcoming me here today. For almost 40 years, I have worked back and forth between Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean. I lived in the Dominican Republic uh, in the late 80s and in Mexico in the late 90s. But I'm not Latin American, just a close friend and chosen family member. As such, and conscious of the manifold ways that Christians from the global north caused many of the problems that we are contending with in this conference, I will try to focus on the ways that people of faith can either help or hinder the struggle for LGBTI rights and inclusion. In the hope of being helpful to broadening the conversation, I will begin by sharing something of how the United Church of Canada took its relatively progressive history in Canada on LGBTI rights and inclusion into conversations with global partners. Canada decriminalized sexual activity between adults of the same sex in 1969, but discrimination persisted. The United Church began to defend the human rights of sexual minorities in the 1970s. It resolved in 1988 to end barriers to membership and ministry of gay men and lesbians. It decided in favor of equal marriage in 2003. A series of decisions a decade ago welcomed trans people into full participation. In the past 15 years, we deepened conversations among churches and social movements for LGBTI rights and inclusion. A series of consultations helped to ensure that we were working in ways that placed global partners and their contexts at the heart of the conversation, always inviting and trying not to impose. In 2019, a Latin America regional consultation was held at the Reformed University in Barranquilla, Colombia. That's the photograph that's behind me here. And what I share today draws from that event. In Latin America, a key issue for LGBTI people has been to end persecution by opening public space and increasing protection. I, I, it's hard to talk in generalities about such a huge region and, and, uh, and large number of countries, but uh, progress has been made, um, even though extreme levels of violence persist. Our consultation in Barranquilla was grounded in Colombia's struggle for peace with social justice. In the past two decades, the late stages of a 60-year civil war, I came to know people in the municipality of San Onofre, Department of Sucre, close to the Caribbean Sea, a three-hour drive from the city of Cartagena. The worst of the violence perpetrated by paramilitary death squads had eased by the time of my first visit to that area in 2006. I traveled with leaders of Colombia's Methodist Church who had accompanied local communities of Afro-Colombian and indigenous peoples through the bad years. In 2015, Colombia's National Center for Historical Memory published its report on violence against LGBTI people during the Civil War. The section on what happened in San Onofre, where young gay men and trans women were forced into boxing ma matches and publicly humiliated for the pleasure of the paramilitaries, gives urgency to my words to you today. Across Latin America, with regard to LGBTI rights and inclusion, you find a panorama of contradictions. While the region has high levels of violence directed at LGBTI people, it now has some of the world's more progressive laws for protection and equality. Most countries ban overt discrimination, and transgender persons can change their legal gender and name without surgery or judicial order. Some countries ban conversion therapy, and same-sex marriage is more frequently celebrated now. But these gains coexist with violence and restrictions on access to rights. Because of bullying, the LGBTI population tends to abandon the education system early. LGBTI people suffer discrimination in access to housing, health services, and have fewer job opportunities. Every day, four LGBTI people are murdered in Latin America and the Caribbean. In 2018, Brazil saw at least 420 fatal victims of anti-LGBTI violence. This past October 25th, Joana Domingos, just 19 years old, became the 141st trans person murdered in Brazil this year. The report of our consultation in Barranquilla stated, in most cases, this violence is silenced or treated as commonplace and banal, and that aggravates the effects of the violence. We also saw that hate speech is legitimized by Christian fundamentalist groups that denounce what they call gender ideology, what uh, 
Caleb Orozco mentioned earlier. I mentioned Colombia earlier, where the stories of victims of the war, including women and LGBTI people, have been told. But the very act of gathering such stories and then the strong influence that voices of victims had in the peace process enraged conservative politicians and their religious allies. To them, telling the stories and demanding change represented the imposition of gender ideology. In Colombia and elsewhere, including Canada, these groups try to instill a sense of panic by singling out the movements that respect sexual diversity and support gender justice. They describe LGBTI movements as threats to public health, the traditional family, established religion, democracy, and the social order. They would also deny or defund sexual and reproductive health services, as well as attention to HIV positive people and the LGBTI migrant and refugee population. With well-funded allies from the global north, they bring their advocacy to civil society spaces, including those of the Organization of American States, where they outnumber the progressive religious voices. Christian fundamentalists justify themselves by waving the banner of religious freedom. But freedom of religion is like freedom of speech. Neither can be upheld in ways that undermine the rights of women or people who are discriminated against because of poverty, race, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. Defense of sexual rights and gender justice is not anti-Christian. It does not, as the fundamentalists allege, attempt to put men above women as a sort of revenge or to homosexualize the entire population. Women and LGBTI people have been mistreated throughout history. The time for change has come. Some churches defend the dignity of women and LGBTI people. I mentioned the Colombian Methodist Church earlier, which supports inclusion. Other churches across the region do so as well, together with a tiny handful of Catholic bishops. They create spaces for mutual listening, weaving networks, and planting seeds of peace and justice as they raise their voices for a world of greater solidarity. Some seminaries adjust their theological education so that the ministry of inclusion practiced by Jesus becomes a model for contemporary ministry. The Interdisciplinary Group on Religion and Public Advocacy, GEMRIP, carries academic and theological reflection on gender justice into public debate. Many Latin American and Caribbean churches and ecumenical groups participate in the Global ACT Alliance of Relief and Development Agencies. In 2017, ACT approved a gender policy that states, and I quote, the ACT Alliance is committed to respect and empower and protect the dignity, the uniqueness, and the intrinsic worth and human rights of every human being. ACT Alliance does not accept any discrimination on the basis of gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, nationality, race, religion, or belief, class, or political opinion, so that all people shall have the same power to shape societies, faith communities, and their own lives. Those of us who met in Barranquilla last year invited churches and ecumenical groups to work in ways that recognize the dignity and spirituality of LGBTI people and our need for pastoral accompaniment as part of the whole people of God. In place of fear and prejudice, let us build alliances of solidarity across all borders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for, for that. It's, um, it's sad that the pattern repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. I sometimes think that it's time we got up and started a new Christian church. We call it the Inclusive Church. And then we can add our own voices, formally, with all the others. And then, by God's grace, they'll have to listen, won't they? Yeah, so thank you very much for, for that. And stay on for the question and answer, please. Uh, our last speaker for the morning in the panel is Carlos Navarro, who is the co-chair of the Mexican network um, of uh, Rainbow Catholics. Uh, welcome, Carlos. Uh, 